I was asked to give some early recollections of myself and Freddy books. I met Freddy in a branch of the Calgary Public Library near my home in 1954. I was 10 at the time. A librarian spotted me going through the stacks trying to find something interesting to read. All he had was spine titles, no colorful dust jackets. And she came over, started up a conversation, and very shortly went over, pulled the book off, gave it to me, and said, I think you might find this one interesting. I'm not sure which of the Freddies it was. I think Freddy the detective, but honestly, I'm not positive. But very quickly, I was hooked and started reading others. Uh, one of the early ones was Freddy Goes to Florida, or Two in the Game. And in later years, I realized that in that book, I began encountering how things in the Freddy stories would stick in your mind, sometimes in ready memory, other times popping back in when needed. Uh, I was quite ex interested when the animals were visiting Washington, D.C., uh, and marching behind the band playing Marching Through Georgia. Now, I had no idea where Georgia was. <laughs> I had no idea what the song was or of its significance in American history, but somehow it excited me. I even made up a little melody to go with it, and I'd sing the title over several times. Looking back, now I realize that I did not make up the memory. I pinched it subconsciously from the chorus lines of uh, Waltzing Matilda. <laughs> I, I heard the real thing about seven years later, courtesy of Tennessee Ernie Ford, and also learned the lyrics at that point. And a number of uh, years later, uh, a little more equipped with knowledge of the U.S. Civil War and uh, the significance of marching through Georgia, uh, on my graduation parade out of my second year of military college on the West Coast, uh, a Royal Canadian Navy band played Marching Through Georgia as the principal march past tune. And I was wearing a scarlet jacket and a pillbox hat, but by George, I thought Freddie and the gang were right <laughs> along with me. Uh, there was another aspect of Freddie Goes to Florida that actually came back earlier, and that was a couple of years after I read the book. In school we were learning about the Spanish explorers and conquistadores, and when I hit the name Ponce de Leon and Balboa, bang, I was right there remembering the grandfather of all the alligators musing on munching contentedly all afternoon on one of Balboa's boots of <laughs> fine Spanish leather. <laughs> and uh, I had memories of the grandfather of all the alligators ever since. In fact, I was a little worried about him when the hurricanes were on. <laughs> um, the Freddy books do have things that would stick in the mind. I remember uh, uh, Michael Cart uh, saying, uh, reciting, some poetry by old Mrs. Peppercorn. Uh, the light from some far distant stars does not reach Earth for yards and yards, which when you stop and think of it is a very succinct summary of the vastness of space. Um, Michael said, who could forget those lines? Uh, certainly not him, however much he tried. Well, I had the same experience. That poetry was an earworm that would pop up <laughs> now and again over the years. I couldn't remember what book it was. Michael assisted me on that, and I had forgotten reading Freddy in the spaceship, but by George, there was old Mrs. Peppercorn churning out the poetry. Um, it was uh, various other books. Uh, again, a scene from one book that I always remembered. I, I mean, it wasn't a constant memory, but every now and then it would come to me of Freddie and Jenks in this department store where they were isolated by a flood and it was warm and safe and you could just sit there in these comfortable chairs and read books to your heart's content. A sanctuary. Michael again 
very quickly it ended. <laughs> Fried uh, Fatty and the Clockwork Boy for me. Uh, but it struck me that that had appealed to me for particular reasons uh, in that stage of my life. My favorite Freddy book is Freddy the Magician. Uh, it was the only book where I tried to emulate Freddy. I uh, got a book on magic from the library, tried to learn some. My career was, shall we say, short and uh, Inglorious. Uh, my father actually made a savant, a magician's tool for hiding stuff uh, behind the edges of tables and so on, but that wasn't much help for me. But 40 years after I read the book, I had a, a weird experience. Um, I, had, I was a lawyer at the time in Edmonton, this was 1994, and I'd had a disagreeable incident with a client who was a stage magician who had run into some problems with, over a hotel bill. And um, the hotel said he'd stayed longer than they'd agreed to put him up for and had charged too much to his room. He had a different version. I was able to negotiate a settlement which was agreeable to both sides and uh, the magician, who was a very nice guy, I quite enjoyed him, um, said, well, he would pay that. He had to leave town. He was still on a tour. He was from out of town, but he was touring too. And he'd be back in about three months. Well, he was back in three months, but the hotel explained that he had not, alas, paid the settlement. So I discussed that with him and got some more excuses that I was beginning to recognize, uh, you know, just put it off. Uh, I presented him with a bill for my services. It wasn't uh, immoderate, shall we say. Well, our warm, cordial relationship collapsed like a cheap tent. <laughs> In fact, a few days later, I got a very abrasive phone call from him. Now, without getting further into that, I was feeling very down and bad about it. And uh, it just really got to me. And as I was sitting, feeling sorry for myself, I heard a voice within me. Now, I was not hallucinating, and I knew that it was something deep in my memory producing the words, Zingo Stingo. <laughs> <laughs> my first three eyes seemed way ahead of me. Uh, my first reaction was, what? Zingo Stingo came again. Oh, yeah, that that crooked magician, the, the hotel cheater, the restaurant belker. I went over to my library, local library, the next day. They didn't have the book, but the uh, librarian tracked it down somewhere in Saskatchewan, got it in on an interlibrary loan, and a couple of weeks later, I reread Freddy the Magician, cover to cover, in about two hours occasionally pausing to roll on the floor laughing. <laughs> but but <laughs> the wonderful thing was by the end of that, I was no longer mad at my client. Freddy's antics with Zingo somehow diffused my bad feelings. And I think to me that's part of the magic of Freddy. If you look at how Freddy dealt with villains, he was mm -hmm stout in taking them on, but having beaten them, that was it. He was magnanimous. He didn't uh, stomp them. He didn't kick them when they were down. He didn't do a sack dance around them. <laughs> he was decent about it. And that was a good lesson to keep in mind. And part of the value is that when you look at it, permeates the Freddy books, a, a sense of decency, of honorable, pleasant behavior. Yes, there's horrible villains sometimes in the Freddy books, but they are disposed of, but they are not ground into shreds. In my case, I don't know why. I, I wasn't mad at that guy anymore. I began to see him as uh, somebody who was kind of down on his luck on the downside of his career. Yeah, let it go. So that was one I owed to Freddy. Thank you. <laughs>